All right. So please finish up the Socrative exercise you're working on if you haven't already. We'll go through that in just a minute. So we mentioned, starting last class, we had a brief discussion about the difference between wild type and mutant and how we define wild type versus mutant. And we discussed that this was, so this is just review, we discussed this is always relative to the population that we're talking about. So I want to step back to some Socrative activity that we did, I think, the end of last week, mid last week. I showed you a couple of pictures of flowers. These are dwarf dogwoods. And I asked you in that Socrative quiz, poll, survey, which one was wild type? And I don't remember if you remember what you answered, but you had 29 say plant A is wild type, 20 say plant B is wild type, and two people were brave enough to say both were wild type. Based on our definition of what wild type means, does anybody want to change their answer? Which one is more wild type, do you think? It's pretty close. 29 on the left, 20 on the right. We should come up to a consensus, probably. Yeah? Isn't the one with the least wild type because there's more of that as opposed to the one without the least? Are there more? That's the question. Absolutely. That's exactly how you would define which one's wild type. Which one of these, and you probably aren't familiar with these because they don't grow this far south, I don't think. Which one looks more like a wild type plant or one that's more common? Dwarf dogwoods, it turns out, don't have leaves grow out of the middle of the flowers. Like most plants, you don't usually get leaves growing out of the middle of the flower. The flower is its own entity. What's weird about the plan on the right that made people think that that was not wild type? Yeah, it's not, it's not symmetrical, so maybe there should be a leaf there. It turns out that the plan on the right is more wild type looking, and this is definitely a mutant. Most dogwoods don't have leaves growing out of the middles of their flowers. You. Take a look at your results from the Socrative quiz. Interesting. All right. So let's take a look. There's a few of you are still working on this, but so it looks like a lot of you watched the video for today. How do you assess dominance in genetics? So it's going to involve a cross. Let's see. So I said B or D, but a lot of people said D and then some A's and some B's. So I think we probably ought to spend a little bit of time walking through this. So why are B and D correct answers and A, C, and E not? What do you do to assess dominance? What sort of a cross do you have to set up? Yeah, so you want to, the, right, the goal, important difference. You start with all homozygous, that is pure breeding, and the goal is to wind up with plants that are plants or whatever you're talking about, in this case, that are totally heterozygous. Because it's only in the heterozygous state that we can tell which, there's two alleles. You can tell which one is driving the phenotype. Is it the first allele or the second allele? So in that case, we're talking about how many loci here? Two, the P gene and the Q gene. So what sort of a genotype are we trying to produce? Down here, which is called a 
dihybrid. We're trying to make a dihybrid genotype. Big P over little p, big Q over little q. Okay. That'll tell us, for the P gene, is it the capital P or the lowercase p that causes the phenotype that's dominant? And at the Q locus, is it the big Q or the little q? This is the only way to tell. Put those two alleles into the same organism and ask what's the phenotype. You only get one phenotype. It's the phenotype that's driven by the dominant allele. So the question really is then on the left, those five choices, which of those crosses produce only individuals that have that genotype? So first of all, we can cross out anything that's not homozygous. So that rules out the parent on the left in option A, right? not homozygous, so not a pure breeding individual. The same is true for either parent in cross C or the parent on the left in cross E. So we've already eliminated some options. Now, do either of those remaining ones, B and D, produce dihybrids? What do you think? Yeah. yeah, they both do. B will produce big P with little q, and the parent it's crossed to will produce little p with big Q alleles. That generates a dihybrid. And the same is true for that parent down there, you get little p, little q gametes, and big p, big q gametes, which also make 100% dihybrids. So there are lots of different crosses. This is the point, and it's not just for fun. Not that it was fun. It's not just for fun. I'm doing this example purposefully to point out that there are, and this is important for you to know going forward, there are many ways to create the same genotypes of offspring. There are lots of different parental crosses genotypes of the parents that you can use to produce the exact same F1 genotypes. That knowledge will come in very useful later. Any questions about this? So the parents have to be homozygous. They need to be pure breeding. The other requirement is that they have to produce, depending on how many loci you're looking at, a monohybrid or a dihybrid offspring only. Let's check out question two. Oh, Seventy percent of you get it right, so sorry, we will not spend time in class going over that right now. But I can answer questions during office hours or Wednesday at the review session if you like. So more practice on dominance. So nice job on that question. One more really important thing to mention before we move into the new material. I have not told you this yet, but now that we're talking about dominance, I have to point this out. Up until now, I've told you tester individuals are just homozygous at all the loci we're interested in. Add this to your notes. The tester individual has to be homozygous for the recessive allele, if there is one. There isn't always. But if there is a recessive allele, the tester is homozygous for the recessive alleles. In other words, up until now, we've said that <coughs> this could be a tester genotype. Pardon? Okay. And that's not true. So now we know, just because I'm telling you, but it's true, a tester is defined as an individual that's homozygous for the recessive allele at every gene we're looking at. So one more little tidbit to add on to the definition of a tester. Questions? Yeah? So then just to clarify, Please. on that previous Socrates question, B would not be a second answer. Indeed. So based on the quiz today, when you go back, which could be a tester 
you would not have any testers that have capital letters. But remember, this is only when we know dominance. So if there's one allele that's dominant, a capital letter, and one that's recessive, a lowercase letter, then the tester will have the lowercase, all lowercase, homozygous for all of those. If it's a situation where I just number the alleles, for example, if I was talking about a situation where I don't know anything about the alleles, that could be something like this, where I've just numbered gene A, we've got allele 1, allele 2, don't know what the dominance relationship is. So you could claim that either homozygous A1 over A1, that might be the tester, or it might be that A2 over A2 is the tester. So what would you do to figure out which one is the tester? How would you figure out which allele is dominant, in other words? If you have an A1 over A1 individual and an A2 over A2 individual. You cross them. You find out experimentally, just like we were doing, what sort of genotype is their offspring? <coughs> They're heterozygous, A1 over A2. So what's the phenotype? Well, I didn't tell you what the phenotypes of A1 and A2 are. But if that individual looks like that parent, which allele is dominant? A1. And then you would know that the individual with the recessive allele, A2 over A2, is the tester. So like the movie said, the only way we learn about dominance is to actually empirically, scientifically find out for ourselves by doing this cross. We have to observe which one's dominant. There's nothing we can do to look at a DNA sequence, for example, and decide whether or not an allele is dominant or recessive. So you actually have to be working with the organism itself and find out for yourself by doing a cross. Yeah? Just to clarify, how one is supposed to be A1-A1 times A1-A2, or is it supposed to be A1-A1-A2? That one, this... Because how would you get that? That genotype right there, I'm just making these up. So I'm just saying, you could, if you were doing a test cross, that could be that cross with a monohybrid and somebody that could be a tester, but we don't know yet. The other possible test cross would be that same dihybrid or monohybrid cross to the homozygote for the other allele. So it's one of those two, and we had to do the cross between the two homozygotes to find out which one was dominant. Then we know which individual is the tester. Thank you for asking. So a little bit more about dominance before we get to an activity where you get to do a little bit more work practicing. Yet another Socrative poll that I gave you, talking about brachydactyl, and I was surprised. 19 said that this genetic disorder is caused by a wild type allele. 36, mutant allele. 10 can't tell. I'm going to take the temperature in the class right now. Who, does anybody want to change their vote? What is brachydactyl called by a, caused by a wild type or a mutant allele? So is it, how do you, how do you decide? Well, it's what? not what's common. Depends on the population you're looking at, but in this room, for example, everybody, no, I suppose we shouldn't ask people to show us their phalanges. It may, it's probably true if you go out into our population here in Fresno that most people don't have brachydactyly. So it's caused by a mutant allele. There's a genetic difference that causes this developmental alteration. Okay. Easy. Now, this is where things get tricky. Is this a dominant or recessive mutation that causes brachydactyly? A recessive? 
Okay, so why is it recessive? I'll, I want to make sure I take each. Because if, if it was dominant, then um, all it would take would be at least one version of that allele could be in the, po in, in the population where okay. it could be more pronounced. So if it's recessive, then uh, recessive, I'm sorry, it could, uh, you could have it, but not express it, which means that you'd have uh, less people with Okay. Does anybody else want to add to that? Yeah, go ahead. I'm kind of comparing it to like in horses, the black gene is dominant, but you rarely ever see black horses. So the recessive <coughs> alleles are more common, but that doesn't make them dominant. Okay. So contrasting opinions. We've got one opinion that if a genetic disorder is rare, that probably means it's recessive. Because if you do a cross, as we've been looking at in class, if you do a cross between two individuals that have brachydactyly, so let's say it's dominant, let's assume it's dominant, capital B causes brachydactyly, then you'd get our normal three to one ratio of brachydactyly to what's little b over little b then? Non brachydactyly which we would call probably wild type. It's what almost everybody in this room has. So this sort of sets up that, wait a second. So if it's dominant, then shouldn't 75% of people have brachydactyly? By the way, don't fall for this because I'm misleading you at the moment. The other camp is just because there's a dominant allele doesn't mean that it's common. Right? So horses, black gene, you said? for the black stallion, <laughs> right? So this is a really important point about dominance and predominance. And I want to take you all back in time to the prestigious, heady scientific days of 1908, don't memorize the date, to when Dr. Hardy of Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, which we're going to get to eventually, a famous geneticist now, writes this sort of academic smackdown in the journal Science. It starts. I am reluctant to intrude in a discussion concerning matters of which I have no expert knowledge, and I should have expected the very simple point I wish to make to have been familiar to biologists. However, some remarks of Mr. Udney Ewell, to which Mr. Punnett, yes, of Punnett Square fame, has called my attention, suggest it may be worth making. And here is that quote. If brachydactyly is dominant, as we just, as I just drew on the previous slide, Brachydactyly is dominant, this is what Ewell is saying, then wouldn't we expect to see three brachydactylous individuals to every one <coughs> normal wild type person? In their case, if you have two brachydactylous individuals have offspring, they would be a three to one ratio of their kids. In that family, yes, 75% of the offspring would have brachydactyly, and there'd be 25% that didn't. But when that one couple in their family is having a three to one ratio of brachydactyly, what's happening to every other family and the kids they're having? Would this be like skipping a generation? This pedigree, and we're going to get into pedigree analysis in a little bit, shows that it doesn't skip a generation. That's something that we'll see we expect of dominant disorder. And that's how physicians first found out that brachydactyly is dominant. Because they look at it and they see brachydactyly, the filled in symbols, the black symbols, from generation to generation to generation. Every generation, there are some brachydactylous individuals in this family. But if that one family is having three brachydactylous kids and one wild type kid in their family of four, how many people with brachydactyly do you know? Anybody? Okay. So in our population, what's the frequency of the brachydactyly capital B? It's zero. None of us in the population we're defining as this class plus our friends, acquaintances, there are zero brachydactyly alleles. So in the case where there might be a family out there that is producing in a dominant fashion, offspring that have brachydactyly, 
every other family in our population is having the same number of kids, four, and none of them have brachydactyls because that allele, the dominant allele, isn't in the mother or the father that are producing those kids. And that was the point of that letter that was written in 1908, was that yes, in an individual family, you'd expect a three to one ratio of offspring, but in every other family where there is not the brachydactyly allele, you don't produce any brachydactyly offspring. And so a rare allele is rare. It doesn't mean it's dominant, shows up in every generation in the cross, but brachydactyly is not predominant. Nobody here at least admitted to knowing anybody with brachydactyly. It's a rare medical condition. So just because it's not wild type, which is common, because it's mutant, because it's rare, doesn't mean that it has to be a recessive allele. So this is just a rare example of a dominant trait that's rare. Right, so a heterozygote or a homozygote for capital B would be brachydactylus. And the only genotype that produces wild type is little b over little b. But if the frequency of capital B is, in this room, zero, let's say it's 0 0.01, let's say one individual in 100 has a brachydactyly allele, then what's the frequency of the little b's? 0.99, because frequencies have to add to 1. So that just means that, yes, when brachydactyly exists out in the world, it's dominant. It goes from individual to individual in that family. But at the same time, the other 99 families that are having kids aren't, don't have the brachydactyly allele, so they don't pass it on. It stays rare. Even though it's dominant, it passes from generation to generation, every generation. See, for example, here is that affected father passes it to how many of his offspring? Three out of four, like you'd expect from the Punnett square. In fact, I guess that lets us predict what the father's genotype is. I know this is getting ahead of ourselves, but if he can have an unaffected offspring, what's the unaffected offspring's genotype? Yep, little b over little b, which means that like the things we've been practicing in class, you get the offspring's phenotype, you can predict the genotypes of the parents. We know that each of the parents, if the offspring here is little b over little b, what do we know about the parents? Each of them has to have at least one little b. So what's the question again? I missed it. Um, that, that square yes. is a mate of one of the offspring. This square? No, 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 no. Can we just consider? Oh, yes, you're absolutely right. I'm sorry. You're absolutely right. Yeah, that's not a sibling. So <laughs> to fix things, <laughs> <laughs> hey, look, now it, make, now it works. <laughs> The good news is this underscores another point that I made last class, which we're going to talk about after the exam next week, which is statistics. If you expect a three to one ratio of wild type or of phenotypically mutant, we've got mutant, 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 three offspring, all mutant. We're going to get to why we have to use statistics to know for sure. Is there a probability? Is there a chance that those two parents could have that wild type kid eventually? 
Because maybe if they had one more kid, that would be the kid as I drew up there. That would be wild type. And that's the only way we'll know whether or not the father is, as I suggested erroneously, heterozygous, or is the father actually homozygous for the big B over big B. What will be true of all of the dad's kids if he's homozygous for the dominant allele? They all carry one big B. Every offspring, if dad is big B over big B, even if he married an unaffected individual, all of their kids are going to have brachydactyly. No matter how many kids they have, right? Every kid they have is going to get a big B from dad. Dominant allele, they will have brachydactyly. And then if you have even one kid wind up not having brachydactyly, then you would know that the father had to have at least one little B allele. So he could have 12 brachydactyly kids in a row, and we would never know what his other allele was. It could be that they were all inheriting the same big B over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. But as soon as he has a non brachydactyl kid, then we know, and that's what we talked about last class. Homozygote offspring tell us a lot about the parent genotypes, where heterozygotes don't tell us much. Please. Yeah. Um, so, how exactly did we establish that brachydactyl was big B dominant? What if we weren't given that information? We just assumed that it was little b. Wouldn't we still consider it recessive if we were given that on the exam and we just went at it? Okay. So, what would we have to do? if we wanted to know for ourselves whether or not brachydactyly is dominant or recessive? Just statistically analyzing it, if it's both a mutant gene and it's recessive, it would have been gone years and years and years, generations ago. It would not appear again. Unless strictly homozygous brachydactyly, people were mating with strictly homozygous brachydactyly people. Hmm, that's an interesting point. So from a population genetics perspective, it might be that the recessive mutation would be lost from the population. We'll talk about that a bit more as the semester rolls on. But experimentally, what would we do to find out whether or not brachydactyly is dominant or recessive? We would take humans, like Big Brother, we'd stick them in a house together and we'd see what happens. <laughs> You'd have to do the cross. You'd have to find an individual, which we can't do in humans, which is difficult. You, who knows what a pure-breeding human is, but if you had pure-breeding humans, <coughs> then you'd find out that it's the inheritance of that capital B that causes brachydactyly. Now, at this point, I put the cart before the horse. I apologize. Um, it's the pedigree analysis in this case that defines brachydactyly as being a dominant mutation, not a recessive mutation. So it's not that anybody set up crosses between humans to figure out the dominance pattern. It was all pedigree analysis, and that's what we're going to start talking about next week in class after we do the exam. And then it'll become much more clear how you could figure out just from looking at inheritance from generation to generation whether or not something is dominant or recessive. But this is the ideal, especially for this test. The end of class today is going to be the end of content for the exam, of course, since Wednesday is a review session. That's why I'm hammering home a lot of this discussion about using dominance and assessing dominance, because there's not a lot of time between now and Friday, Friday for us to practice it. I think I put at least one of these questions on the mock exam, which I'm about to pass out to you at the end of class. So like last time, I'm going to distribute the mock exam through Google Classroom, and then I'll post the key tomorrow or Wednesday. You can take it, see how you do, come to class on Wednesday, bring questions, we'll talk about your questions, and then you'll have until Friday to prepare. Okay, so here's what I'd like you to do. With a partner, by yourself, raise your hand if you want, I'll come answer questions if you have any. Sorry, let me move this a little bit. There you go. 
So we already talked about the parents. We did that earlier this class. Now I'm suggesting that you've crossed them together and you get F1s that look like the plant shown below, the F1. So I just want you to answer those two questions. Which phenotype is dominant? And then a little bit more intricate maybe, answer question two. Okay. So work on that for about 10, we've got about 10 minutes if you need it. And I'll come around and answer questions if you have it. And then we'll come back together, discuss the answers, and that'll be it for today. So we know that the parents are pure breeding, so they're homozygous. So I'm going to say, I'm going to use capital L. For leaves in the flowers. Okay, so that would be, we define by doing this cross, because that offspring has a leaf in the flower, that the capital L, the leaves in the flower allele is dominant. So we get a heterozygote F1. And most of you figured out that when you self that heterozygote, you set up the normal Punnett square, where you get either little L's or big L's in each of the gametes from this individual. And you could use a different notation, that's fine. Notation's up to you. You don't have to use big L's and little L's. That was not part of the question. <coughs> so ratio of leafy to non-leafy flowered plants. What kind of a ratio is this? Genotype or phenotype ratio? This is, if we're talking about le how many plants have leaves in the flowers versus not, that's a trait, that's a phenotype. So for every three leafy flowered plants, we get one that's not. Everybody okay with that? So capital L, one or two, doesn't matter, that's the dominant allele, which we defined by doing this P0, F1 cross. <coughs> So how do we get to, what's 456? The only information I've told you. That's 456 is the number of plants, we've got a three to one ratio. 456 is the number of individuals we see that have leaves. So the question is 456 to what is a three to one ratio? So how do you calculate that? Divide it by three. So 456 divided by three gives you the answer, 152, <coughs> except my penmanship is horrible. Stylusmanship, 152. And you can check yourself. So 456 is, a, is three times 152, that gives you Again, by definition, a three to one ratio. So you'd expect, if you see 456 leafy plants, 152 non-leafy flowered plants, a quarter of the total individuals. That's the individuals that comprise that square in the lower right. Yeah? So for clarification, the phenotype that is dominant is the leaf on the flower? Correct. And we decided that because of this cross where we took homozygous pure breeding parents and crossed them to create a heterozygote and we found that the heterozygote had that same phenotype that was in the parent that had what we arbitrarily called the capital L allele. I was so confused because it said um, assume their F1 looks like the plant shown at the right and because it said pure breeding I thought that all of F1 was going to look like parent on the right, which was little L, little L's, because I didn't understand the question that you were saying. You were referring to F1 as the picture on the right instead of the parent? Yes. So if because if this, so if you did, if you encountered this on the exam, how would you know which was the P0 and which is the F1? P0 is the first generation, the F1 is their offspring. And that's why I was comfortable saying, shown it right, referring to, because I said F1. 
But I understand where the confusion comes from, and as we've discussed, you should definitely ask me during the exam, during the exam, raise your hand, ask me a question if you have a clarification that you want to make. If you don't feel like asking me during the exam, because you're afraid that I'm going to tell you something that's going to blow your mind or mislead you, don't do that. Remember, you can write down assumptions you make. I'm okay with that. You say, assuming that when you say plant on the right, you're talking about this plant, then I would answer the question this way. I prefer if you ask me during the exam, because then that helps us grade, because we make sure everybody's answering the questions in the same way. But if you don't, write out assumptions you make. So as long as we do the phenotypic ratio, we can find the, um, the phenotype of F2 and R? Right. There will not be anything on the exam we haven't covered in class. So no, not yet. Next exam, yes, this exam, no. So the content ends in about five minutes, and we haven't talked about, some of you submitted some practice exam questions that were not on content we've covered. I did not include those in the practice exam. We haven't talked about epistasis yet, for example. So no, if we haven't talked about it in class, if it hasn't been part of the reading or the assigned videos to watch before class, then it's not on the test. So for this exam, it's uh, Punnett squares, dominance, uh, hybrid crosses, uh, bad balance test crosses. I suggest checking the syllabus and then going back to everything we've covered so far to make sure. Because I could say yes, but I might be forgetting something. I don't want to explicitly say that you've covered everything in that list. And I do want to, I don't know if I should apologize or not. I add videos to our YouTube channel before I assign them. I noticed that a lot of you have been watching videos before I assign them. That's fine, but really you don't need to watch them after I add them to the channel until I've said you should watch this video in preparation for the next class. It might wind up confusing things. Right. If you start watching things before, we plan on talking about them. Um, is there any way you can upload like the past the credit stuff that we've done, or is that like a... Like a yeah, thing? that's a great idea. So I can upload, I have PDFs of all of the quizzes. Yeah, I will do that. Thank Thanks for asking. Good point. Yeah. So we, yes, in, indeed. We talk about the answers during class, and we have those as part of the recordings, but you don't necessarily have the questions. Yeah, I will do that. So, um, by the way, at the end of the last class, I posed a couple of questions to practice. One of you after class asked me to record a key and post it, so it's already on our YouTube channel. I didn't go through them in class because my explanation's online. And for next class, that's it. I'm going to send you the mock exam right now. Come with questions on Wednesday. And I've got office hours now for an hour.